All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Morris Blokey, and I'm a teacher, librarian, school librarian in Casa Grande, Arizona. And welcome to the 2024 Tucson Festival of Books. The festival organizers thank Chuck and Carol Otto, the Stocker Foundation for sponsoring this location, and Peggy Sharp for sponsoring the upcoming discussion. The panel will end in one hour, and we will have 15 to 20 minutes for a Q&A near the end of the session, so please hold your questions until then. And after this session, please make sure to stop by the book sales area and author signing, and Kate will be there to sign your books. The book sales support the festival and the local literacy programs. You can also help keep this event free and open by becoming a friend of the festival or a sponsor of the festival. And as we begin, please silence your phones. And so joining us today is Katie Camillo for Every Good Story is a Love Story, a conversation. So please welcome Katie. And I'm also going to make a quick land grant statement. We respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui peoples. And I'll introduce you. Okay. Katie Camillo is one of America's most beloved storytellers. She is a former national ambassador for young people's literature and two-time Newbery medalist. Her books include but not limited to, The Tale of Despero, Because of Winn-Dixie, and The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tuman. Born in Philadelphia, she grew up in Florida and now lives in Minneapolis. And her new book is Ferris. Okay, now I'm interviewing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, how many of you were here uh, when we did the panel this morning? Was that not spectacular with Dan and Vera? And Lisa, yeah, it just, and this is such a nice, it's like when we walked into this room this morning, I thought, this isn't going to work, but it works great, it's actually very intimate, so I'm just glad to be here with all of y'all, um, and uh, Lisa has a ton of questions that she's going to ask me, and I'm going to dodge and faint, and <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing, so okay. I'll pull you out from under the table, yeah. all right, yeah. So as we begin, I want to take this time to thank you officially for the stories that you write. As a librarian, you make my life so much easier as kids to love your books. I still believe in the read aloud, so let's begin. My name is India Opal Deloney, and last, no, you said it exactly right. and last summer, my daddy, the teacher, sent me to the store for a box of macaroni and cheese, some white rice, rice, and two tomatoes, and I came back with a dog. Yeah. <laughs> You know, because it, everything that happened with that book was so unexpected. That was the first book, and, and I thought that might be it, and I might be like doing county fairs 30 years from now, saying that my name is India Opal Baloney. And so I just feel so fortunate that that book is like opened up this golden door to all of this, to this community with readers, librarians, teachers, kids. And like, um, it changed my life and let me do all these other books. So I'm sorry for saying along with you, but I really did. I, I read it so many times that I thought this might be my life, you know, and that's okay, you know. Yeah. My daughter and I watched the movie this weekend. We did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. The movie. Yeah. <laughs> replaying it. <laughs> so how did the Dixie and Opal find their way to that first story? So that, that, that book is very much a um, product of homesickness and um, dog withdrawal. Um, so I, uh, I, I had moved, I grew up in Central Florida, um, and I had uh, moved to Minneapolis. Um, and um, I'd never been to Minneapolis before, and my general thought was, how cold can it be? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I discovered very quickly how cold it can be. And, uh, and I had one good friend, I was living in an apartment um, uh, where no dogs were allowed. And so, and the second winter that I was there was at that point uh, one of the worst winters on record. And I was, you know, I just felt homesick for uh, Florida, and one 
night before I went to sleep, I heard this little girl's voice say, I had a dog named like Dixie in a southern voice. And I thought, okay, that's, I'm gonna start there with that. Um, and that, that's where it came from. Is that too long? <coughs> no, that's great. I could, yeah. I could, I got more that I could tell you. It's like, <laughs> that's cool. well, the, 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 what a fool I made of myself because I miss dogs so much. Like if I was in a car and there was a dog in the car next to me, it would beat. Um, and I made up the dog. I mean, that's how intense. And so I made up the best dog that I could think of, you know? So, yeah. As someone who has read all of your books, thank you, you're welcome. Your stories are resplendent with the resounding themes of love, light, and hope. Yet these things have come by way of loss, grief, and sadness. And why do you feel like these are the themes that you keep returning to? Yeah, um, I don't know why those are the themes that I keep returning to. I have discovered that I keep returning to them and I've, I've had it pointed out to me. Um, and I feel like most writers have a couple of themes that they get to work with throughout their life and if you're lucky you get to keep on turning it and looking at it from a different angle. And I have learned not to uh, think, oh, I can't write about those things again because those things are the things that preoccupy my heart increasingly they preoccupy my heart so and the stories are a way to for me to wrestle with those things and also then to make community around those things so yeah. this <laughs> good afternoon <laughs> so i was thinking this morning that moment you know before the sun you know comes up and kind of still have a sleep just about the whole world and how do you how do you make that fit with what's going on in the world without like going on that's not going to do anything about this but you you don't make that decision how do you move forward and continue to write these amazing stories for this all hope yeah, what a big question, Lisa. And, and yeah, no, I know, I know, because I didn't see you look down and read it. And and it's it is um it is a way for me to anchor myself to the the beauty of the earth and the beauty of the people uh, around me, and a way to generate hope for myself. But it's also um, I feel like, because um, I just, after I, we did the first session, I went and signed, and I see those, uh, those kids' faces come through, and I think, um, I have to do, it. you have to make that hope, and that light, and that love, and stories are the way that I know how to do that, so. And yet, you write books for children. I read an essay that you wrote in response to a question that Matt Dillon Pena asked you, and I will ask you this now. How do you tell the truth, and how do you make it bearable? Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, a lot of people die in the book. Yeah, I was gonna say, are we gonna start listing off all the terrible things <laughs> in my books? Um, you know, I. It is true, it is, um, the, you step outside, this is, Tucson's beautiful, I've never been before, um, and you, you're, like, it's so beautiful, and so, it is so astonishing, we are so lucky to be here, it is so beautiful, and also, uh, to be here means that we're gonna lose people, and that, and to love means that you, that it had comes guaranteed with law. So I feel like every good story um, has to tell the truth about that, which is that it's painful to be here and it is beautiful to be here. And that that's what a story needs to do is, is celebrate those, those two things. Do you not think so? I totally Okay, all right, I thought maybe we were mounting a counter argument. <laughs> <so. laughs> yeah, no, that's not no. No. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> but your newest book is a little bit different, Ferris, um, in that you have surrounded the main character, which, by the way, already has multiple, multiple star reviews, with abundant love and stability at the beginning of the story. Please talk about Ferris and why now and why this story. Yeah, this is um, uh, difficult 
Um, and also, I just want to say that, like, being up here with somebody, it's like, I want to look at all of y'all, but I don't want to ignore Lisa either. So I'm just going to look around like this, you know, which doesn't make me seem very trustworthy. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, um, I, I, my father left the family when I was relatively young. My father passed away um, in uh, 2019. Um, and, he was, and we were estranged, and I haven't talked about any of that um, when he was in the world, um, but now that he's gone, and it, he himself had a horrible childhood, and um, he was a difficult person and a difficult father for me. He died in 2019, and uh, on the last day of 2019, on his birthday, my best friend, had uh, her first grandchild was born. And um, so I'm walking through the world on the first day of 2020, looking at the pictures of this child with her, uh, both parents, both sets of grandparents, everybody's face is lit up, right? And I think, look at this child. She has just been loved from the minute that she arrived. And I thought, what if I wrote a book about a kid that just was loved from the minute that she arrived? And, 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 and that's where Ferris started. And it was, um, it, it was only after I was finished and, and uh, like it was that I started to see that I would not have been able to do that. I would not have been able, you know, it was the first complete family that I put in a book. I wouldn't have been able to do it without writing all the other books, without finding the community and the connection and the love through all the other books that I've written. So, does that make sense? It does. Yeah, sorry for cheering up. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very satisfying. Beautiful, beautiful story. It, her name is Rainy, that little girl, Rainy. Yeah, so. Looking back, did you always want to be a writer? Uh, I know you no, were a reader. I was a reader, and um, I'm, I'll be uh, 60 at the end of this month, and I always say to kids, um, I never, um, one, we didn't do creative writing in school. I learned how to write an essay. And two, I never had an, a writer come in and, and talk to the class. I never met a writer. I don't know what I thought, but I didn't think that human beings wrote books. <laughs> and so it was just like, it just seemed too magical, right? So I, I didn't want to do it when I was a kid, and it wasn't until I got to college um, that I, I um, really kind of like latched on to the idea when I had a, a professor um, uh, say to me that I had a, this is a direct quote, these words are imprinted on my brain. You have a certain facility of words, period. You should consider graduate school, period. And I thought, at 21, I thought, he's trying to tell me I'm really, really talented. And um, <laughs> it's like, why bother with graduate school? I'm just going to go be a writer. So that's when I got the black turtleneck. And that's when I like, started like telling everybody that I was a writer and, like, and dreaming about being a writer. And it wasn't until... You know, I was almost 30 years old that I sat down and started to write. So, you know, let that be a cautionary tale to you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm kind of weird. Yeah, you, we're off script. So we're off script. So do you, do you feel that you can do this forever? And these stories will, these amazing stories. You know, it's so funny. Is it because I'm I'm old now that people are asking me that <laughs> question before? It's just like how it, you the, the subtext seems like how much longer are you gonna? <laughs> <laughs> are you? Um, I I feel like I feel like I cannot believe the astonishing luck of finding what I'm supposed to do in the world getting to do it and get paid to do it. I mean, that's like, that's, and so it's like, I can't, and I can't conceive of not doing it. So I want, yes, I, I hope there are, are more stories and more books in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But because your stories are all so different, except for the except for preoccupations the with, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, how do these seeds find 
there we have the story. I mean, I want to look inside your brain. And how did this work? I, you know, it's funny because I, I saw you like. I did. And it's like, and I thought I wondered when you were doing that if I had my notebook in my purse um, because that's where, and it's back at the hotel, and that just like made me feel all little spasm of nervousness. I have a notebook that I carry with me everywhere, and the notebook is um, uh, a reminder to keep everything open, um, my eyes and my ears and my mind and my heart. And um, when I talk to kids about writing, um, I. I quote Flannery O'Connor who says the writer must never be ashamed of staring. There is nothing that does not require her attention. Um, and so I've, I'm an eavesdropper and I am, uh, I've got to do it um, without my mouth hanging open. Um, <laughs> I'm much better, I used to be like this. You know? But I'm always listening, I'm always paying attention, I always have that notebook. And I, and I also pay attention to what goes on in my head, so if a name pops into my head, it goes into the, the, the back of the notebook. And sometimes it will sit there for a long time before it like comes up in a story, but I'm just like always kind of paying attention to what I see and what I hear and also what pops into my brain. So about your names, I was going to ask about that next. Yeah, so okay. where do you come up with these fantastic Names and has there ever been a situation with your publishing, with your editor, where they said no? It, yeah, but no this thing. is funny. Yeah, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll do uh, I'll do that in a, in a second. But I'll say um, that I've been asked the name question from the very beginning, and um, and I you know I grew up in a small town in Central Florida. Um, I went to um, school with a boy named. General Payne, um, and and I like this is like years and years ago. I woke up one morning and, and thought, did am I making that up? Or is it, and, and I called up Tracy Bailey, the the friend that I grew up with. And I said, did we go to school with a boy named General Payne, or am I making that up? And she said, oh no, General Payne and his brother Sergeant Payne. And, 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 and so I I offer that as a, a thing. Like, you know, that I got that at a young age. That made me receptive to, you know, different kind of things. And and everything about writing is hard for me except for the names. They they, they pop into my head. And then to your question about how have I ever been told no for a name, the magician's elephant, I was just talking about this when I did the event with John Chu um, a couple days ago. Um, the Peter Augustus Puccini is the boy, and uh, my editor, the name before that, she did not like and, and um, wanted it changed. That's the only time it's happened. And I hated her for a long time. <laughs> but she was absolutely right, yeah, absolutely right. And, and it just took me, it, it was interesting to me to watch my brain see how much the name really has to do with the rest of the story. So, yeah. yeah. So has writing stories become easier for you? Oh my goodness. Like, raise your hand if you think that it's easier for me now. That's right, yeah. No, no, it never gets easier. Um, and, and I don't think that it should be easier, yeah. Um, I think that uh, it was so interesting, if y'all were in the, with Dan and Vera this morning, it's just like none of us have an easy time of it. Um, and it's, it's something that is worth doing, though, you know? So it's just like it doesn't need to be easy. Um, yeah. Your first book, Because of Wind Dixie, was published in the year 2000 and was named a Newbery Honor Book. You have since published over 30 books, which have sold over 44 million copies. 45. Did you hear them? Yeah. <laughs> I heard you. I was like, I don't believe it either. Titles were awarded the Newbery Award to Taylor Desbro and uh, Florin Ulysses. You are also a former National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. How do you think you have changed as a human, as a writer during this span of time? Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it is that thing of. Uh, when we were talking in the panel about the books changing, when you're a reader, a book can change you, and as a writer, 
it changes you. And, and I have been deeply, profoundly changed. I have become, I have found my way towards a wholeness um, because of writing the stories, but not just because of writing them, but because of that thing where they go out and connect with people. And it's like I, I say to kids sometimes, we might never meet, but it doesn't make any difference. I can feel you there, you know, as the reader. And so there's that profound, it's like these invisible lines that connect me to so many people. And it's like, it, it, it has been life changing, you know? And a lot has happened in time since your first novel. Do you think readers, you just touched on this a little bit, have changed? You know, I don't, I, I still, um, I still, I, again, I'm flashing on the faces that I saw on the signing line. I just, I still see kids who clutch books to their chest, who, who live in, I, I don't, there is still that profound connection to, I'll, I'll ask, how many of y'all are uh, teachers and librarians again? Let's do that. Um, and I mean, do you, do you feel that things have, Changed profoundly, uh, or do you, you, you do? I see you nodding. Yeah. Yeah, fewer school librarians. Yeah. But that thing of a book still being able to speak to a kid's heart, that still happens. And that to me is miraculous. Yeah. And we're so grateful for that, really. Yeah, well, I'm grateful for y'all. So, um. Have you ever gone back to a story and discovered truths that you didn't know were there? We talked a little bit about this. You mean like going back and rereading well, something? Just I've kind read. of, or, or have you ever seen yourself in a story or seen something that happened that you didn't really mean to be there and you're like, huh, that's it. interesting. Yeah, or you know, like um, Tiger Rising, we all know Tiger Rising, I always think that as my shy child, you know. Um, but Rob has that terrible rash on his legs and um, when I was writing that book, I never once thought about um, me as a, a child, I was like eight, nine years old, and I had a terrible rash on, that went all the way up my life. I never, it's not like I'd forgotten it, but I never once thought about it as I was writing the book. And it was only once the book was out in the world that it was like, wow, that's where that, you know, so it is that thing where you're always writing behind your own back. And, and um, it's just, it, it's so funny that I didn't even consider that, yeah. Another recent book, Puppets of Spell Horse, is the first volume of three in the Norn details. Can you talk about this book and the two to follow? Yeah, so the, these are like kind of fairy tale novellas. Um, and the Puppets of Spell Horse is about uh, five puppets and, um, um, uh -huh. finding their way home. <laughs> like, wow, yeah. Uh, wow, and, and um, it, you know, the, I had written this before the pandemic, but then the next two, uh, Hotel Balzar, and then there's a third one um, that's gonna come too, they were very much products of the pandemic. And it was like, I was walking along thinking, I need a story that is gonna like take me away from all of this. And and that's, so that, those fairy tales came after the puppets. And they are very, very loosely linked in that they, they take place in the same magical, any place as possible kind of world. Just three, you know, no more. just three, and then I'm, I'm working on some other fairy tale. Pay no attention to this uh, over here. But <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, so yeah, I've got more fairy tales in me. Yeah, yeah. What feedback have you received from readers that validated the topics that are addressed in your books? What feedback have I received? Um, I cannot believe, uh, I, I get, I get a lot of mail. Um, like, let's tell this story about how the pandemic, during the pandemic, I heard a lot from teachers who were reading aloud over Zoom and who the, the other older kids in the family would come in uh, and listen to the story being read. And that to me was really profoundly moving. 
so it's just like it was a third grade teacher reading aloud because of Went Dixie, and then here comes the fifth grader, and here comes the seventh grader, and eventually all the kids in the house are coming in to hear the story. That's 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 what y'all do, and that's how much story matters. I think. Yeah. And all the grown-ups in the house. Yeah, boy, you know, because we, we need it too. You know, I'll say that sometimes when I leave an event, go home and read to your adult. You know, we, we, all, we all know um, to read to kids, but it's like we, we need to hear stories too. Yeah, yeah and I've, I've enjoyed them this week as I had a particularly rough week. Yeah, so no Thank kidding. you for yeah. Yeah. giving me a light at the yeah. end there. So. You also write a series of funny and smart books for young readers, Tales from Decawood Deca Drive, about the hilarious and heartfelt escapades of the pig, Mercy Watson. <laughs> what differences, if any, have you found between writing books for new readers and middle grade readers? Well, Mercy Watson is a unique kind of creature. Um, you know, uh, how many of y'all know the Mercy Watson books? It's just like, uh, you know, when I wrote that first Mercy Watson, I turned it in to my agent and she said, I have no idea what this is, <laughs> but I love it. And then she sent it to um, a Candlewood Press, my editor, and I'm like, we don't know what this is, but we love it and we will find a way to make it work. And then I heard from librarians and teachers, it's like, oh, this fills a niche that we didn't, you know, that there was just, and it, what a thing. You know, that is like so incredible. And so, they, they, and they're so much fun to write. You put Mercy in a, in a situation and then you just like stand back and follow her, which again, teachers have, have figured out. I get so many, you know, like Mercy Watson stories that they'll have their kids do. Um, and some of them are just like unbelievable. Like Mercy Watson gets audited. That was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what's going on in that house. Uh, Mercy Watson meets Moby Dick. I mean, they do all kinds of things because they figured out the same thing that I figured out. You, you have this character, you just put her in a situation and then you stand back and, and watch it all happen. The other thing I love about Mercy Watson is that um, when you write books for kids, people always, um, they always say, what lesson did you mean to impart here? And it's, I don't know if adult writers get that or not, but Mercy Watson is the answer, nothing. No, no, no one learns anything. I mean, she loves toast with a great deal of butter. Yeah, and she's unrepentant about it. Um, and so those, those, and if they are, um, they're a delight to write, and they're also, it's kind of like, I feel like the sorbet in between heavy courses, you know? It's always so much fun to, to turn to one of those. Chris Van Dusen, I mean, the, 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 is astonishing. And Chris Van Dusen, oddly, um, sometimes wants to go and work on his own books rather than just doing Mercy Watson because I could write a Mercy Watson book every, you know, I just love doing them. But Chris, Chris has got other things that he wants to do and I can't do them without Chris because he's a genius, period. Yeah. So will there be more? Or? Um, well, yes. Yeah, there, there might, there, I mean, there's definitely, that we just, yes. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe me, I'm as invested as, as you are because they just make me so happy. Yeah, yeah. So you've talked a lot about reading and what it's meant to you. Who started you on your road to becoming a reader? And who has helped you along the way? Yeah, so um, this is a shout out to my mother, Betty Deep Mellow, um, who uh, read to me all the time. Um, but, uh, and I went trotting, I was one of those kids, so when I was growing up, you didn't learn to read until first grade, and I went in expecting to learn to read that day, and I was, you know, like, so utterly just devastated that you didn't learn in a day, and, and, and then I, not only did I not learn in the first day, it was with phonics, and, and I could not make any sense out of what they were talking about and it panicked me because I knew that what I needed were books and stories and words and and so I came home and I said to my mother 
I didn't say it. I am like I had a meltdown. It's like I don't understand what they're talking about. You know, I can't do it. I can't. And she and my mother. I, I wish I could have said this to her before she passed away. There are many things I thanked her for, but this this was beautiful what she said. She said, for the love of Pete, calm down. <laughs> and then she said two super important things to me. One, she told me who I was. She said, you're smart. Um, and uh, then number two, we'll figure a way around it. Because that was a thing of like, my brain was working differently and it was just like so, and she made me um, flashcards, and uh, I memorized. That's how I, I learned how to read. And she knew my brain well enough to, knew that, to know that that's, that was the thing to do. So um, every day after school, I came home and I did flashcards with my mom. So thank you, Betty. Yeah. And teachers, librarians along the way? Oh, of course, yes. Teachers, uh, teachers reading aloud to me. And um, I said that this morning in here about um, Miss Alice at the public library who waived the, uh, the limit of books for me because I was a true reader. Yeah, and so I, I feel really fortunate in that I got to be seen every step of the way, yeah. I'm sure there's many people in the audience who are interested in um, improving their writing craft. Do you have advice? I do, and and um, I, it, it's whether you're eight or you're um, seventy-eight. It's the same advice, which is read as much as you can, and I'm sure all of y'all are doing that. Um, uh, write, um, as we discussed earlier, some of us miss that step. Um, we're just so invested in our black turtlenecks um, that you know, it just takes a lot of energy. So you just have to figure out some way to do the work. For me, it was deciding that I was gonna do two pages a day, that was my way in. But you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it. I, I was interesting to me that Dan said that he doesn't use an outline either. And I, I remember being um, in, at a, in a gymnasium at a school in Connecticut, and um, I was talking about how I do not outline, um, and uh, a little boy raised his hand and said, what if, your teacher makes you outline. <laughs> and I'm like, is your is your teacher in the auditorium? <laughs> and, and he's like, yeah, that's her right there. <laughs> so, um, I I had to turn to her and say, if I was the kid in your classroom and you told me that that was the only way to write a story, I would not be able to do it. So I, all of which is to say, there is no right or wrong way other than if you feel like you're supposed to be doing it and you're not doing it. That's the only thing that's wrong. It is very much an individual journey. So you read, you write, and um, you, you have to rewrite because um, there's a great book called Art and Fear. Does anybody know that book? Um, and it talks about how there's one genius born every um, every century, one Mozart who hears the music and puts it down, and then they say, guess what? That's not you. Um, <laughs> so, and so if you want to make any kind of art, it's not gonna come out right the first time. So you have to be willing to rewrite um, and keep a notebook. And um, you know, everybody was always saying to me I should go to law school. Um, don't go to law school. Um, yeah, so, yeah. get pushed that way if you have a early facility. Yeah. So we get a picture of you here promoting your book. And it feels very much like this is the, the real Kate. Oh, oh, yeah, this but is me. It's a big mess. What, yeah. is the, what is your life like back in Minnesota? Um, Do you have a street? I like Decalou Drive. Yeah, um, I do, um, and and I, you know, I, I love to eat, and I and I, I don't know how to cook, and I'm not going to learn now. Uh, but, but I have found a lot of people who are really good cooks, and they all live within uh, uh, like a couple blocks radius of me. And I like to tear things out of the New York Times that look really good, and then drop them in the mailboxes. <laughs> and, um, so that takes up a, a lot of time. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it is. It is. I, I, the, the, my life is like that. It's. I, I. I am lucky enough to be surrounded by friends. I, I have a dog that. Um, I walk. Wait for it. Eight miles a day. Everybody's like, "Oh no, poor Ramona. She's fine." <laughs> <laughs> so I just wear her out. 
and and I write, um, and um, I try to find the beauty in the world. So that's what, yeah. That's like a pretty good interesting. Yeah. So going back to Ferris, there's so many amazing characters. Um, do you have a favorite one? I mean, I. Uh, do you have a favorite one? <laughs> S sister who. The pinky, pink, yes, thank you. Pinky, pinky is um, what my mother would have called a piece of work. Um, <laughs> uh, that she was the younger sister uh, who um, is intent on becoming um, an outlaw. That's her. That's her goal. Um, and um, she just gets into a lot of a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah. I, I do. I do love her. Um, and she's one of those characters who. Um, threatens to take over the story, you know? Because, yeah, she would like it to be her story, but it's Ferris's story, you know? Yeah. Ferris takes it back, I think. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a struggle. Yeah, I, yeah. I think he makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah, it feels so good to laugh, yeah. Um, we talked earlier this morning about books that you could recommend to the audience. Not everybody was in our session, so do you have any books that you would like Recommend. Yeah, you know, here we go. Yeah, it's like, and I, I, I it, it, it's just like an absolutely blank. This happens to me every time. It's a blank slate. It's just like a book. You want me to recommend a book? Uh, but it's just like I don't know what that is. I have a little book. I'm gonna send it to you, and it says what I'm reading, and it's small, and you can put it in your purse. You That's good, and then I could take it out because, like, Dan had his written down on his phone. Yeah. Um, and there have been so many good things that I've, um, you know, I all, it, it, this is a book on writing. How many of y'all are interested in writing? It, it comes out in April and it's called, I love the title so much and it's a really good book called Truth is the Arrow, Mercy is the Bow. And it, it is a, a book on craft and writing that I just uh, uh, love. And that came out in April. I, I'm glad I thought of a title of something. Um, <laughs> You know, when we were talking, I, when I met um, Vera before we came over here, who wrote um, The Night Diary, yeah. I, that book is, if y'all haven't read that book, it is, it, I said to her, it's, I put it into so many adult hands too, because it makes you understand something that we really don't know anything about, which is partition. And it was just like it, and it is so beautifully done. And it was, so it was interesting to her hear her talk about it being a multi-generational thing and that she wrote with that in, in mind. That, you know, that people, and that, that's, you know, that's just a gorgeous, perfect book, so. Yeah. Everything I know about history, I learned in the children's books. Right? No, right? I remember um, being in a, a, listening to a librarian book talk, um, a book, a nonfiction book about, um, undersea creatures, and, and then she talked about whales and how uh, whales and their flippers have fully articulated hands. It is like it's the same as our hand uh, on a large scale inside their flipper. And that is in a children's book in the non, I mean, it's just like, yes, everything we need is here. Yeah, with the children's books, yeah, yeah. Are there any stories I haven't asked about or anything? In general, that you no, know, it has been wide ranging, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I look a little nervous. No, that no. I, 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 I would love it if y'all want to ask questions so we can kind of like have a group conversation. That's yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can share for us any of from any of the times the moment that you found that Oh yeah, it's another thing I can never do without crying, but here we go. So, uh, so um, <laughs> you know, you get the call, right? And um, and for Tale of Despero, um, I it was they were on the west coast then, so it was later in the day. It was like nine or something, and um, when when they called, they all called together and the chairperson, that was Eliza Drains, and said, 
um, it introduced herself, said that she was there with the committee, and that um, I'm calling to tell you that. See, here we go. <laughs> Your book, The Tale of Death Row, has been, you know, and and I said, can you say it again? <laughs> and she started over from the very beginning. Hello, I'm. <laughs> And went through the whole thing beautifully. And I said, can you say it again? <laughs> and again, she gave it with everything from beginning to end because it is so unbelievable because this is the thing. I was, you say Newberry to me, and what I think, it, I have that flashball memory of me standing um, in the Cooper Memorial Public Library. There was the spin rack of the Dell Yearling Newberries. Um, and I was in there in my bare feet because it was Florida and that's the way it rolled in. <laughs> and um, and uh, spinning that rack of Dell, I, I, I knew to look for that metal on a book. You know, eight year old me did. And so to think that it's on something that I wrote is just, um, and then when I was, I was uh, Mr. Shu of a librarian when we did this event in uh, St. Paul a couple days ago, and Mr. Shu was on my second Newberry committee. And so when he and I told the story of them calling, they called at 5 30 in the morning, said it, and I kept, I was sobbing, and I kept on saying, but it's a book about a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that's that's what it's like. I keep the Newberries, because people will ask that question, in my desk in the second floor on the left, all the way at the back. And every once in a while, I will slowly open the door, the drawer, and like lean forward and look at them to make sure they're in there, and then I'll close them. <laughs> yeah, it's so amazing to me. You can probably shout out. I, I, I think I so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I can. So you talked about your own experience as an author, but I want to know, I'm a little curious why or how you encouraged Ann Patchett. She dedicates uh, Tom Lake to you. <laughs> how and I encourage Ann Patchett. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she dedicates the book to you. Um, so, um, Ann, um, the, the funny thing about Ann is that um, uh, she, it, it, do y'all know Ann Patchett, the, the writer? So when Ann says something, everybody listens. And so Anne, uh, I, I had gone to the store a couple times, um, her store in, in, at Parnassus in Nashville, and, um, and the people who worked there um, were like, oh, Kate's a big fan of yours. And um, so they would roll her out and push her in front of me, and I would say hi, and she would say hi, and then that was it. And, and, um, and then uh, Anne was sick one day, and she read The Miraculous Journey of Edward T. Lane. She hadn't read anything that I'd written, and she read that, and then she read everything that I wrote in one, in one great long sickness, right? It was just like she read everything all at once. And then she wrote me an email that said, I've been a jerk. Um, I didn't, I should have read you, and this is like, it, it, um, and thank you for these books. And then she went and wrote a thing during the pandemic about these are the books to read now because they're short enough and no one could concentrate and all of that. And like, so it's not what I've done for Anne, it's what Anne has done for me. Because when Anne says read it, everybody's like, okay, Anne. Um, and so, and, and, and then in the course of all that, we became very good friends. And um, and she's one of my first readers and I, and I read for her. and. We usually check in with each other uh, first thing in the morning, um, and I'll say I'm going down the rabbit hole. And when she was working on uh, Tom Lake, she would say I'm going out to the cherry orchard. And so then at the end of the day, I would send an email saying, you know, come, uh, come on out from the orchard. I'm, I'm holding up the light. So that's that's why she said um, for for Kate who held the lantern high. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yes. Um, this is the most important question you'll get all day. What kind of dog is Ramona? And it is, is Ramona seconds that, yes. <laughs> and is she named after Ramona Quigley? Uh, okay, um, like, 
Ramona is like the quintessence of Ramona uh, Quimby. I mean, she is in all ways. So, so yes, of course she's named after Ramona, the pest. Um, and, uh, and she is a, 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 gold, a smaller golden doodle, so she's about 35 pounds, and she is um, a, a real handful. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. She appreciates you asking that. Yes. <laughs> so everybody heard the question, it's about the films, and, um, and uh, have, do I have a favorite, and is there one I really don't like? Um, I'll just, let's just say this. Um, one, you know, the, the thing about getting a movie made is you have uh, one way to control it. When they say, we would like to make a movie, you can say yes, or you can say no. And then that's it, you know? And so, and, and depending on who's making the film, sometimes they want you involved, sometimes they don't. Um, and so I have, I, I think of the books as my kids, and I feel like it's like I can't, they have to go out into the world, right? So I always say yes, and because, um, it is a wonderful thing how movies will bring people to books. And so I, I just kind of like let them go and, and hope for the best. Um, and I have been mostly very pleased and I feel fortunate every time it happens. You know, there are the movies and then there's also, a, this is something that is kind of like a, a, not a movie but is deeply pleasing to me that Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane has been turned into a, a play that a lot of community theaters will do. But it has also become like a one-act play, um, and so that schools' uh, competitions will put it on as a one-act play, and uh, that is so amazing to me to watch it be condensed down into that. And it shows me how the story is, um, has nothing to do with me and everything to do with it being retold in different ways. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So for the purpose of Star Wars, like you said, it's fairy tales, fairy tale series, and now you're working on more fairy tales. <coughs> what is it about fairy tales you're so drawn to right now? Yeah, I know. It's a good question. It's, it's, so the question is why am I, so I've got these, this trilogy of fairy tales and I'm working on fairy tales. Why am I so drawn to it? And it's a question that I kind of like considered in the peripheral for myself. I don't ask myself a lot of questions um, because I don't, but I think it is that timelessness um, that, um, it, it, and, and how fairy tales speak to the constancy of who we are as human beings. Um, and so there's a comfort to that, that timelessness for me right now. I, I find it anchoring, I guess. It's a really good question. I'll think about it more on the plane with my notebook when I'm eavesdropping on the people. Because, <laughs> wow, people say astonishing things to each other on the plane. Yeah, you know, when, and when people get, people that don't know each other, like, will ask each other, I mean, like, really, it profoundly, like, somebody was, like, crying about their divorce on the plane on the way here. And I was just like, wow, it, it, to, to a stranger, you know? Um, yes. Uh, I, I was one of those kids who, um, I, a, as a child reader, I, I loved everything. You know, I kind of like read without discretion. There were books that I came back to again and again. Um, there was a biography of George Washington Carver that I kept on checking out of the library and my mother's, I remember my mother saying to the Salas library, can't we just buy it? And, and, and her saying, that's not the way it works for me. And, 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 uh, and I also loved Abraham Lincoln um, and uh, like so biographies of Abraham Lincoln. I loved Paddington Bear. I loved um, I loved the 21 Balloons. Does that still get, um, no? Um, I loved uh, Harriet the Spy, which is basically a primer on how to be a writer and the dangers therein. Yeah, um, and uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't quite old enough for, I mean, young, I was too old. I missed uh, a lot of the Ramona and Beezus 
boats, but I got mouse and motorcycle um, and love love that. Um, and then as when I was um, like 32 years old and working at a pretzel stand, I read through all of the Ramona uh, and Beezus books and just was utterly delighted by them. And those still get read, don't they? So back, yeah, yeah, Beverly Cleary, yeah. Yes. What inspired me to write Edward Tulane? Um, you, you asked that very well, with a great deal of authority. So um, I, I have, um, it, you know, sometimes it's hard to talk about exactly where a book came from, uh, came from, but this, that I, I will tell you that I received um, as a gift a rabbit doll um, who is like, um, it, comes up to about here on me, um, and he's dressed in this very elegant outfit. And um, when the friend gave him to me, I said, what's his name? And she said, Edward. And I said, thank you very much. And I took this rabbit doll home, and I put him on the couch in my living room. And then every time I walked into the living room, I screamed the whole screen. <laughs> really a creepy looking rabbit. <laughs> and I thought, wow, well, I wonder if I'm gonna be able to like sleep with him in the house, you know? It's just like, he just was kind of weirding me out. And then like the third night of the rabbit being in the house, I had a dream about him where he was underwater, face down on the ocean floor with no clothing on. Yeah. A, a naked rabbit dream. Yeah. Uh, I think all writers have them, and I'm just not willing to talk about them in public. And, and I, thought, I thought, that's that would be a great picture book, is what I thought. So I started with that image, and, um, and then I sat down to write, and this is the only time it's ever happened. I mean, usually I do like uh, five or six drafts before anybody reads it. That book told itself. And, um, and I knew it was a gift as it was happening. So I just, you know, it just all unspooled. So that's where it started. I still have that rabbit doll. Yeah, and he's um, in my office um, and he stares at me as I write. Um, and sometimes I pat him on the ears and say, you have been a very productive rabbit. So, <laughs> good gift, I didn't know it at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, all the way in the back there. Eugenia and baby. Eugenia and baby. Uh, I don't know where Eugenia and Baby came from. Um, I will tell you that I had, uh, I don't know how many of those stories under my belt by the time I moved into a house where I was introduced to the lady next door who told me her name was Eugenia. And it was a terrifying moment for me um, <laughs> because I thought she was gonna think, you know. So I don't know where they came from. What is always amazing to me about those sisters is um, that, uh, Baby Lincoln is beloved, but who the kids really, really love is Eugenia Lincoln. You know, and and I don't know, I don't know why. Um, it's like I, I was over at a friend's house the other day, and uh, the neighbors next door, the three-year-old, peeked over the fence and said, "I love Eugenia Lincoln. <laughs> She's grumpy." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it's just so much fun to do them. They're so very much themselves. You know, it's the same as Mercy in that way, that I just always know um, what they're, they're going to do. So, yeah, thank you for loving them. Yeah. Um, yes. Yep, you. In Tale of Despero, I read it with my kids, fourth and fifth graders. And they asked me, hello, one of my kids, they asked me if you intended the historical references because they think, this is 10, 11 year olds, they think all the adults in the world should read it so they can see how ridiculous the mouse castle with their hoods on were and that you really can love somebody who's not like you. Oh. So they, they asked if you intended that. Yeah, so should we just cry together? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> The best part of me is in that book without me, the, the smarter part of me, the better part of me, and that y'all meet me there 
is an incredible, incredible thing. Um, and I, it's just really interesting to have that you're in her class. You're in her class? You were, okay, I was gonna say, yeah, okay. Um, that, that is that thing about that, that, that safe place that we make for each other when we're reading out loud and it's the best me, the best you, and the best child. It's like all of these wonderful things that I would never think of if we discover together. Yeah, so thank you for what you do, and thanks for making me cry. Uh, and, yeah, and you did it without crying, but no, like, no, ask them. Yeah, 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 thank you. Um, yes, you right there, yes. What inspired Despero? What inspired Despero? So I had written Because of Win Dixie, and by the time it got published, I had already finished um, Tiger Rising, and that was done, right? And then when Dixie went out into the world and I just thought, oh, we only have five minutes left, but I'm just getting warmed up with these people. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, like, wow, look over here, keep it short. Okay. So um, everybody loved Win Dixie. And it was this incredible gift. And I thought I have to write another book like because of one Dixie or else I'm not gonna be able to keep on doing this. And I kept on trying to do that and it wasn't, this is when I figured out you couldn't write to make people love you. So in, in the meantime, I had gone to visit my best friend, again, she who had the granddaughter and her son was eight years old at the time. And he, he was a huge reader and he'd never been impressed with me before. But here I was with my name on the cover of a book. And so everywhere I went that visit, Luke followed me around. And he said to me at the end of the visit, um, can I have a private word with you? <laughs> and so we went to his room, closed the door, and he said, I've got an excellent idea for a story. And I said, what is it? He said, it's the story of an unlikely hero with exceptionally large ears. And I said, what happens to the hero? And he said, I don't know. That's why I want you to write the book. <laughs> and, and so he didn't say a mouse, but I thought a mouse seemed like a very unlikely hero. And I was in this space of trying to figure out at the, okay, I'm gonna have to go in a totally different direction than because of Win Dixie. And so I took that, I, I, and I love the phrase, unlikely hero. So that's where it started with what Luke said to me and, and thinking I needed to go in a different direction. And Luke, by the time the book was published, um, and then on the Newberry was 14 years old, and I made him come to the Newberry Banquet, which is a thousand librarians. <laughs> and Luke had to stand up in front of them and he was not happy. <laughs> but that was, yeah. And now, now he is a history teacher and a writer himself. So, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I, we surely have time for one more. Where did the five minute go from? Yeah. Yes. How long do your books take to make? How long do my books take to make? It depends. Um, like if I'm doing a Mercy Watson, that's relatively quickly. You know, that, that I can, you know, I'll do a draft and then let it sit and then do another draft. So probably in about six months I can do a Mercy Watson. For a, a novel, it usually takes me about a year and a half. And that is like writing it um, and then rewriting it and then rewriting it and then rewriting it. If y'all ever go to Minnesota, you can go to the University of Minnesota and you can go to the Curlin Collection and you can see all of my rough drafts. And um, it will make you feel really sorry for me. <laughs> and it will also do this, which is why I let myself be embarrassed that way. When you look at it, you will think, well, this is, she's no good at this. But, but she keeps on getting better with every draft. And so, and that's how, that's how books get made. So, yeah, it, it takes a while, but it's worth it, yeah. Should I be quiet now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have time for one more. Who's going to ask the last question? Um, okay, you're going to tie everything together <laughs> yeah, and uh, move the conversation forward. forward. Yeah. I'm tying everything together with a hyper specific question. Uh, one of my favorite moments in Win Dixie is the Franny Black story of the bear wandering into the library. And I must know, is this 
grounded in any sort of fact, or did it just come out of your brain? Um, and, uh, so uh, the, the moment, in, and because of Winn-Dixie, when um, the bear comes into Miss Franny Block's uh, uh, a library and um, runs off with a book. So did, was this based on any particular thing or did it just come from my brain? This very strange brain. Um, and uh, again, Tracy Bailey, who I grew up with, who was one of my first readers, on that rough draft she wrote, this was a good day at, at, the, writing, uh, at the writing workshop here. You know, and it's just like, I don't know where it came from, but it was awfully fun to do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I am going to finish with Anne Cash's words, just not the whole. Okay. Is that right. okay? Yes. Yeah. Right. Anne would be pleased. Yeah. And so I started to read more of Kate's books until, in the end, I had read every single one of them. There are a lot, but most have pictures. It was one of the most satisfying <laughs> literary adventures of my life. It was incredibly calming, which is why I mention it now. There's something about being able to read an entire book in one sitting that's an emotionally very satisfying. Not only are the books beautifully written, the stories have gorgeous arcs. They twist in ways you'd never see coming and do not shy away from despair or joy or strangeness. They are each one, each one extraordinary. So maybe you don't have children, but they're not small or not in the house. It doesn't matter. Read them anyway. Maybe you do have children, and you can read these books together as a family. My point is this, don't miss out. Do not make the mistake I nearly made and failed to read them because you are under the misconception that they are not for you. They are for you. Yeah. Katie,